One day a man calls the church, the church office, and he says, I want to speak to the head hog at the trough. <laughs> the secretary is taken aback by that, and she says, excuse me, who do you want to talk to? And he repeats, I want to speak to the head hog at the trough. Well, if you mean the pastor, then you should refer to him as reverent or the preacher, but I suggest you refrain from calling him the head hog at the trough. Man replies, well, I was planning to donate $100,000 to your building program. And she replies, hang on, I think the big pig is just walking in. <laughs> Last month, August 14th to be exact, I preached a message from Psalm 119. And if you were here, maybe you remember the message. I titled it, Prayers and Promises Made and Claimed. If you missed it, it's on YouTube. Uh, in the message I mentioned uh, in regards to 119, Psalm 119, it is not only the longest psalm in the Old Testament, but it is filled with spiritual nuggets of truth, golden nuggets. And I claimed that I had found one in August. Well, I found another. Uh, I found another nugget for us this morning. So with that introduction, the head hog is going to continue his message and title his message, Taking Inventory. Now you may not know this, but I know something about taking inventory. Before I was in the ministry, uh, you're looking at the former material supervisor for Great Lakes Steel in Ecorse, Michigan. My job with the primary steel production department was to make certain that all the materials they would need to make steel were in our inventory. That required that I had to walk through the plants, many plants, and I would have a clipboard and I would write down things that I needed to order, uh, vendors I needed to contact, Sometimes I would go to some of the workers and talk to them and get their input. Uh, I may have even spoke to you, Pete. I don't know. At least I may have seen you over at the 80 inch and ignored you. Uh, <laughs> but that was my job, uh, taking inventory. And it was a very important job because you see, if they ran out of any of the materials they needed to make steel, it would shut down the plant. They were running 24-7, seven days a week. And if they missed something and had to shut down, it was a disaster. So I always felt like I had a relatively important job, and I appreciated that. You know, it, it, it's in my DNA to take inventory any, anyway. I like things to be neat and orderly and in their place. I hate gaps. I hate empty spots. I always want to fill those things up. So I like that job. And not only that, the materials didn't talk back to me, you know? So I had some kind of control. So what am I doing in the ministry? <laughs> uh, no, I think that it's helped. Uh, all those experiences have helped me uh, to become a pastor, and hopefully a better one each uh, week. In much the same way, David is writing Psalm 119, and he's reminding us of our duty as believers we should be taking an inventory, an inventory of our life. And again, verse 57 reads, Lord, you are mine. I like the way the new Revised Standard Version reads. It says, Lord, you are my portion. It's as if David has been busy taking a spiritual inventory and he looks at everything that he owns. He takes stock on who he is, uh, what he lacks. And then in the end, David recognizes there is nothing in this world he could possess better than having God's blessings. So we look over David's inventory. 
Let's use this as our guide in determining what our relationship is with the Lord. Let's begin. I call this room for blessings. And again, remember, we began this scripture. It's in your uh, insert there. Uh, you can read through it as we're preaching. But uh, verse 57 begins, The Lord is my portion. And then in the next verse, look at verse number 58. It says, With all my heart, I want your blessings. Be merciful just as you promised. I like that. I want your blessings. It sounds to me like David recognizes that there is room in the storehouse. Uh, he's taken an inventory. He sees that there are some places that need to be filled in his life. Uh, he needs more of God's blessings. I think this is a reminder for us. What's really important in life? What's really important for our soul? And as a Christian, we can do our best and set our course to serve Jesus and work in the church and work in the rummage sale and bake things and talk about <clears throat> how great our church is. But oh my, take an inventory and maybe we find that we lack some heavenly blessings. Now maybe you're thinking, okay, heavenly blessings, what are heavenly blessings? What kind of blessings? Over in Genesis chapter 32, we have a wonderful story about Jacob wrestling with an angel. Maybe some of you remember that story. After 20 years of running from his brother and working for his uncle Laban, Jacob is on his way home. He's a changed man. He's reformed. He, he's grateful to God and he's ready to return to Canaan and to his family. He's at a place where he feels he needs God more than ever. So it's on this journey uh, that he meets an angel. He has a wrestling match. He holds on to dear life with this angel. And as dawn approaches, let me read to you the <laughs> biblical account. Genesis 32, beginning with verse 25. Listen to this. When the man, when the angel, saw that he couldn't win the match, he struck Jacob's hip and knocked it out of joint at the socket. Then the man said, let me go, for it is dawn. Now, now get this. Jacob panted, I will not let you go, lest you bless me. And, and now we come to the fun part. Uh, an additional blessing that Jacob receives. Uh, this is what's missing in his inventory. Verse 27. The angel speaking. What is your name? He replies, Jacob. Then the angel says this. Your name will no longer be Jacob. It is now Israel. Because you have struggled with both God and man and you have one. Jacob has received a blessing, a dramatic blessing, a heaven-sent blessing. Now, you're probably thinking, what is so special about getting your name changed other than getting married? <laughs> I mean, what's so special about this name change? How can that be a blessing? The reason why we have this story in the Old Testament is to let us know that this is more than a name change. This story is a lesson for all believers today on how we should never be satisfied with blessings, but always be striving for more and more and more of what God has for us. More blessings. More blessings. This is how I want to serve God. This is how I want to pray. This is how I want to serve 
uh, in this church. This is how I want to be a pastor for you. This is how I want you to serve God with seeking more and more of God. I'm not satisfied. I want more blessings. <laughs> with all your strength, with all your determination, hold on to God, just like Jacob did with the angel. You hold on to God. And you say to God, I'm not going to let you go until you give me more. <laughs> I want to be changed. I want to be stronger. I want to be a blessing. This Old Testament story is a reminder that God can really change us. For example, your name this morning might be Old Sinner. God can change it. And your name, when you leave here, can be New Christian. Maybe your name is Tightwad. <laughs> but when you begin to serve God and you get blessings, the wallet loosens up and you just love to give. Give to ministry, give to others, and your name is changed to Cheerful Giver. Or, or maybe... This morning, you are struggling with issues. Maybe you're struggling in the faith department. I want to believe. I want a stronger faith. I'm like that guy in the New Testament that went to Jesus and said, Lord, help my unbelief. That's where I am at this morning. If you trust in God and believe in his blessings, you can change your name from weak believer to very strong Believer in Christ. Hmm. What kind of a blessing do you lack in your inventory? God is ready this morning to meet your need. Whatever it is, you pray for the blessing. Hmm. And you receive the blessing. Whatever you pray for. Because God wants you not only to receive, but to give. There's a, an old hymn in the church, Brian. You know this hymn, Make Me a Blessing. You want to help me out here? Yeah. <laughs> Get over to the piano. <laughs> There's an old hymn. It's not in your hymn books, but it is in our book that we use in the choir. It's titled, Make Me a Blessing. <clears throat> this is how it goes. Wait. Wait. Tell the sweet story of Christ and his love. Tell of his power to forgive. Others will trust him if only you prove. True every moment you live. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. Out of my life, may Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. My first solo at Dearborn Congregational Church. But that's, that should be our prayer. Lord, make me a blessing to someone else. Don't keep it contained. <laughs> Let it shine. We read this 58th verse. With all my heart, I want your blessings. Maybe we should add, and with all my heart, I pray, make me a blessing. Let's move on. My second point is room for praise. I see this in verse number 62. It says, at midnight, I rise to thank you for all your just laws. Again, I like the New Revised Standard Version. It reads like this. At midnight, I rise to praise you because you're righteous, you're holy ordinances. Now let's, let's be truthful. Most of us think of thanking God or praising God 
only when uh, prosperity arrives. And we thank him when things are going well. I got a promotion. Thank you, Lord. I got a refund uh, from the IRS. Thank you, Lord. The kids have finally moved out. Blessings, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> In this passage from King David, he's been taking inventory and he realizes that there are other times, there are other circumstances when we should praise God. It, it could be that God has revealed to David's heart that he's lacking in an area of praise. And so God awakens him at midnight. <laughs> midnight. What a time to be awakened by God. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm a light sleeper sometimes, and I, I wake up at midnight, one, two o'clock in the morning, and I slip out of bed. I don't want to bother my wife. And I have a confession to make. I get on the internet and I read the newspaper until I'm tired and then I go back to bed. But you know what? After studying this scripture lesson, I think I'm doing it all wrong. I should wake up at midnight, one or two o'clock and spend that time and giving praise to God, uh, seeking him. What do you do when you can't sleep? One night at almost midnight, we heard the sirens roar. Everybody in the neighborhood was looking out their door. Then in bathrobes and curlers, they gathered round to see the congregational church was burning. It burned till way past three. Now the pastor looked around, then he stood up to report. This is the biggest meeting that we've ever had. <laughs> Most of you have never come to church and I wonder why. They looked at him, and all at once, they gave the same reply. They said, the church has never been on fire before. The church has never been on fire before. Now that the flames are burning, there's something to come for. But please just try to understand, the church has never been on fire before. It seems that folks now in our day and time are trying to build a church on programs and promotions, and sometimes it seems to work. But if you listen very carefully, a lesson may be learned that if the church will only get on fire, they'll come to watch it burn. Now the pastor learned a lesson that night the church burned down. He got on fire for Jesus and he praised and prayed revival down. And the Congregationalists will never be the same. They've caught on fire too. And the folks there in the neighborhood have changed their point of view. They said, the Congregational Church has never been on fire before. Has never, ever been on fire before. But now the flames are burning and there's something to come for. I wonder, the next time you're up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep, Spend a little time in prayer and praise to God and, and um, ask him to send uh, some fire our way. Not real fire, but, but God's fire. Holy Spirit fire that empowers us as individuals, as a church. <laughs> and, uh, oh, we can use some programs and we can try different things to invite people, but... What will convince them that this is the church they need to be worshiping at is when they see people on fire for God. That brings me to my third point. Room for love. Let's read verse number 64. Uh, again, David is taking inventory uh, of God's creation and the dimension of God's love. He says, O oh Lord, your unfailing love fills the earth Teach me your decrees. Hmm. And I think what happens is in David's inventory uh, uh, review, he looks around at God's creation and he realizes that God has filled this place with his mercy. God has his never failing love available to all creation. 
Uh, this is cause for rejoicing. Boy, this is something to celebrate. Now, I know that the verse doesn't indicate this, but when I read, Oh Lord, I think David said, Oh Lord! I think there was some inflection in his voice. I think there was some power in his voice. Oh Lord! <laughs> He's celebrating. And he understands that God's love can meet every need, can help any individual. God's love is available in every community, every church. The King James Version reads, The earth is full of thy mercy. Full of God's love. Filled with his mercy. A few centuries later, the Apostle John would write about the love and the mercy of God in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's the same today. God is good to all of his creation and he is merciful. True story. This was in the newspaper a few years ago, and it was on television. Kirk Jones of Canton, Michigan, took a plunge over the Niagara Falls, <laughs> and he lived to tell about it. He was interviewed by ABC News, and he talked about how he had been depressed, and he no longer wanted to live, and he climbed over the guardrail at the Niagara Falls and jumped into the river. And he said, as he was going over, he said, at that point, I wished I had not done it. <laughs> but I guess it was too late. <laughs> you know, we kind of chuckle, but isn't that sad? That someone has come to a point in their life when they think, Nothing matters, nobody cares. I'm just gonna jump and end it all. You give up, you struggle with those negative feelings. In the paper, Jones was quoted as saying, I can't tell you why God saw me fit to live at this time, but I'm happy to be alive. I can tell you now that after hitting the falls, I feel that life is worth living. And then he goes on to say that I, I think I was saved for a reason. <coughs> His story is not unusual. We have so many Kirk Jones people in our lives, in our community. We might see them every day and we don't even realize it. They need to know that God loves them. He loves them just the way they are. He loves them. He loves them even if someone has rejected them. And I know that because God loves us so much. He, he sent his son Jesus to go to a cross and die for us so that we might know everlasting life. Only a God who can fill the world with his love can perform such an act. And then back to our reading this morning. Notice what David prays. He says, teach me your principles. The more that you experience God's love and his saving grace, the closer that you get to your creator in his sanctifying grace, the more that you want to know about God and receive his growing grace. He's right there to meet your need. And when you believe that, well, I've arrived, I finally completed the inventory, there's nothing else I need, God will show you, yes, there is. <laughs> and he wants to give it to you. God, God lo God's love does that. You can never have enough or know enough. 
Well, George Burns once said that the secret of a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending and have the two as close as possible. <laughs> well, I've reached the end of my, my message for this morning. You can't end it in a better way than in talking about God and love and mercy. And so, my challenge to you, take an inventory. Don't be afraid. God will help you. And where you see things lacking, ask him, and you will receive. Amen.